and welcome to episode one of Nashi News. My name is Andrew Alsop, and I'll be your host for this first episode. Nashi plans to produce these videos on a regular basis. They will feature human trafficking news, local, national, and international, plus interviews with people active in fighting human trafficking and exploitation. Today's episode will feature news, some encouraging, some disturbing from across Canada. And since this is our first episode, we'll be presenting the history of Nashi with one of our founders and president, Sevilla Koniski. And now to the news. A Newfoundland man living in Calgary has been arrested and charged with child sexual exploitation and the human trafficking of two teenage girls. Detective Amy Spence with the Calgary Police says 29-year-old Harrison Brian Penny is accused of allegedly advertising the two girls ages 15 and 16 online. Detective Spence told reporters that Penny, who is known to police, is alleged to have advertised the girls online, setting up multiple encounters with other men for money. He's also accused of having sex with the 15-year-old. The case came to light in June of 2020 in the course of an investigation into other tra human trafficking offenses. Penny appeared in court in Calgary on charges of sexual assault, sexual interference, obtaining sexual services for consideration, human trafficking, possession of child pornography, and accessing child pornography. Detective Spence says the girls who are doing well physically have the support of a number of community agencies to keep them safe. The Hamilton Police Service is getting $308,000 from Ontario to amp up police work around gangs and human trafficking. Our police services and their partners play a key role in maintaining public safety. They know what it takes to combat crime and hold offenders accountable. This is an important investment and will help ensure our frontline heroes can continue to take action where and when it's needed to keep us all safe. The money will also go towards a public awareness campaign about gangs, drugs, and human trafficking, more police training geared towards sex crimes and human trafficking, crime prevention for at-risk youth, and specialized units for survivor-centered approaches to human trafficking. How are human traffickers taking advantage of the pandemic? The fallout from the coronavirus pandemic is driving more people into forced labor or sexual exploitation, while support services for survivors has been suspended or shut. Factors from lockdowns and job losses to border closures could undo global gains in tackling human traffic in recent years. About 25 million people worldwide are estimated to be victims of trafficking a trade worth $150 billion a year. During the coronavirus pandemic, human trafficking has been driven increasingly underground, fueling fears of more violent means of control used against victims who are being exploited. Traffickers have also expanded their reach through the misuse of internet and communication technology to advertise, recruit, and exploit persons, and especially lure children whom they groom for sexual online exploitation. People are being forced to make risky choices just to make ends meet and support their family. The pandemic has impacted, impacted the capacity of governments and NGOs to provide essential services to victims. If you are a trafficker, this is a boon to your illicit operations. Traffickers are not shutting down. They are innovating and capitalizing on this chaos. Now for some good news a little closer to home. Saskatchewan is introducing new legislation that will provide additional support to victims and survivors of human trafficking. The Protection from Human Trafficking Act creates a streamlined process for victims to seek a protection order against their traffickers. This will prohibit traffickers from contacting them in any way, directly or indirectly. Significant penalties to deter violations of a protection order including fines, Driver's license suspensions and jail terms are built into this legislation. This legislation also enables victims to start a lawsuit against their traffickers to seek compensation for harm suffered. 
Other measures will make it easier for law enforcement to search residences or vehicles in which a victim might be held. As part of the development of this act, the government consulted with its partners and community-based organizations and law enforcement who indicated that would welcome tools such as these charges to assist victims in Saskatchewan. And finally, some very disturbing news, far too close to home. Charges have been laid in a child assault, child pornography investigation in Saskatoon. A 25-year-old woman is facing a number of charges following an investigation by the Saskatoon Police Child Abuse Unit with assist assistance from the ICE unit. On January 11th, 2021, police received a report that a child was being sexually assaulted and images of her were being shared over a social media platform. The incidents of abuse are alleged to have been taking place since December of 2019. The woman is facing charges of a sexual assault, sexual interference, invitation to sexual touching, distribution of child pornography, and making child pornography, committing a sexual offense against a child, attempt to commit a sexual offense against a child, and bestiality. The charges involve two female victims, ages four and two. The woman is expected to appear in Saskatoon Provincial Court in February of 2021. If you have any human trafficking news that you'd like to share, please pass them on to us. Contact information will be shown at the end of this episode. Time now for the interview portion of the broadcast. Today we're talking with Sevilia Kroniski, who will reveal how NASHI began and involved over the past 17 years. So how on earth did a group of people from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan decide that fighting human trafficking was a cause they wanted to undertake? Well, um, it was 17 years ago, and I came face to face with uh, human trafficking in, in Ukraine, actually. And really, I didn't know what it was all about. And then I uh, went to see Victor Malrick in Edmonton, and he explained and he, I, with a presentation that this is a global problem and a local problem. And so when I was en route back home, I decided to do something. And a group of, I called a group of friends, which they may have regretted, <laughs> um, but they are still involved. And, um, and we decided to do something and to address the issue of human trafficking. So before this trip to Edmonton and hearing Victor, um, had you ever heard of human trafficking or present day modern slavery? Coming from Saskatoon, um, growing up in, you know, in a relatively stable household and I didn't. I did not know about human trafficking. As a matter of fact, when I came face to face, I absolutely did not know what I was looking at until somebody explained it. And I said, how on earth could this be happening in the world? So what is the extent of it in the world right now? The extent, in, and there are statistics, and there are somewhere upward of about 25 million people that are caught in in human trafficking. Not all are involved in the sex trafficking, but there are various types of uh, trafficking, be it child soldiers, be it organ transplants, um, domestic servitude, um, and that encompasses countries from all over the world, even Canada. So you've seen this problem but how do you know where to start are there any examples or guides to follow like well <laughs> well actually no or i no i shouldn't say i shouldn't say that what i should say is that i was not aware of any of that neither were you know was the group and so we just took some real small baby steps and and as we, you know, I often say, 
you know, we had no GPS, we didn't have a map of any sort, but we wanted to do something, and that was the commitment of the group. We wanted to do something. And so therefore, we started on that journey. Okay, so what were your first baby steps then? Well, the first baby step was we needed to find out more about human trafficking and the extent of it. Bec uh, just the awareness, of, you know, the, the awareness. And the second part was what we n wanted to do is where, where I saw the issue of human trafficking, um, that's where we wanted to start. And also with, you know, with Victor Malarek's book, uh, The Natasha's, um, the Eastern Europe was a hot spot for girls being trafficked. And so therefore, that was, that was the beginning and, and um, so, and we teamed up with somebody in Ukraine that also was looking at the issue of, of human trafficking. So you ended up building the Maple Leaf House. So what's, what's in a name? Why Maple Leaf House? Well, first of all, we as Canadians, we're, are, we're very proud of the, you know, the, the Maple Leaf. And the Maple Leaf is a symbol of tolerance and unity and beauty in Canada and around the world. And it is alive and it can, we wanted to connect people from, you know, from Canada to Ukraine. And, um, and that was the best way that we thought of. And, and, and also there was the fact that the Canadians are the ones who are con the donors and who have built, you know, the, the Maple Leaf House. Tell us about the house itself. Like what's, what's it in, consist of? The house is a place of, I think the, the, the primary, there's a, it's a safe place for girls. Uh, and, and we focused on, on uh, girls because they are the most vulnerable for the, you know, for traffickers. And the house is a place where they, they stay. They're, it's their home. They go to a village school. Um, and it is a very, it's a healing place for them. Some of whom already experienced sexual exploitation. Um, and, um, we are giving them, as I said, you know, like almost a, it is a, it is a home environment, it is a safe environment, and we are providing everything for them, and of which we will provide them for education, post-secondary education. So how many girls can you put into this the, home? The house was built for 20 girls, uh, however, there are uh, there's one room that's always going to be an emergency room and we now currently have 16 girls and they their age range is from 5 to 15. So how do they choose these girls? Who decides which ones get accept accepted into the, into the house? The, our, our staff there, is the, they're the ones that choose and they are they are the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor. The, they often come from homes that are, um, where there is alcoholism and drug addiction. Uh, sometimes they come from an orphanage that is not doing what an orphanage should be doing, where they can often be sold out of the, out of the orphanage. Um, and our, again, our staff really controls the fact that there are, are, there are thousands of girls that could come into the, into the center or would like to come into the center, but they choose the ones that are, in fact, I, as I, and I underline, is the, the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable. So what kind of condition would they be in when they arrive? Well, Canadians would be very, very upset to see the conditions that they 
are are coming from. Um, when they arrive at our place, they are most often malnourished. Most often they have lice, and they have to be you know treated for that. And um, their education has been. We we had a girl who the, our first girl. Um, she came from an orphanage, and they said that she was in grade four. Um, but she really, she was reading at a grade two, possibly two, grade two level. But they, they said she she was you know up in her studies, um, and off, And this is exactly the same way that most of them come in. Their education has been sorely, sorely uh, missed. So the, uh, the first girls, or the first plans you had for the Maple Leaf House was for uh, teaching life skills to girls coming out of the orphanage at 15, 16 years old. Now you've got five-year-olds in there. What, what happened? Well, what we, as, as you said, we were planning for the ones that were coming out of the orphanage. However, when we did more investigations, and the staff there also did more, and there has always been a team of us that, um, of volunteers that have gone in, you know, not every year, but every possibly second year. And so when we were building the house, we came across an, an, an incident uh, that we were very disturbed about. And what we said was, that again, again, this can't be happening. The younger girls were being targeted, and they were being worth the most amount of money for the traffickers. There was uh, one particular incident that I remember really very, very well. Uh, two traffickers came in to or an orphanage in western Ukraine, and they wanted to buy two girls and they wanted to buy them five to six years old seven years old and the director put a price on them and the price was eight hundred dollars each they then said that was too much and they went to eastern ukraine and they bought two girls and they cost them a hundred dollars each and so we had to then shift our focus for the you know to take care of the younger ones and they all need help they all need help but we just needed to we had to do more of a preventative part than you know than when they would have been if I can sort of say sexually abused. Okay. So you've basically gone from having a girl in the home for a couple of years where they learned some life skills that they were never taught in the orphanages and are able to go out and find work to having girls there for 12 years and then paying for their post-secondary education. So that's a bit of a, a leap in commitment. You got it. You got it. Yes, and and again, you know, I can't underline enough the fact that you know the you know the you know the board is is you know basically in, in um, you know East Western Canada I should say, um, and we have a few we have somebody that's on the board you know from Edmonton, and we have some from outside of Saskatoon in terms of you know Saskatchewan, but. I really want to to thank not only you know the, the driving force of that board, but we really really have to commend our donors who th are throughout Canada and who have been on the same journey with us. And yes, it is a huge commitment and something we you know it. it you have to be able to change. You have to be able to. Um, you have to 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 know what they need more than anything else. 
And that isn't coming from us. That's coming from our staff in Ukraine. And that's, you know, we're the suppliers of the money and, you know, with the maintenance and the, and the commitment. And we, they know that they have a really big family in Canada. So what does the future hold? Well, um, we're hoping that, of course, um, the girls are going to be, um, you know, uh, ed educated, and we have to make that happen so that they they will be um, um, looked after right till 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 they are employable, and. We are also hoping that maybe they're going to, in turn, maybe start another center. Maybe they'll come back to the cent, you know, to well, to the center, to the home, um, where they, where they will help other girls, and that's, that's a huge, huge step. That's a huge step. Well, thank you. Well, I think I'm sure we'll get into some more details about the work there, and um, obviously some updates from the Maple Leaf House itself. But for our first episode, thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Please share this program with your friends. A copy of this video is also posted on our YouTube channel and on our website. Again, if you have any suggestions for topics, guests, or have any news articles to share, please contact us using one of these methods. See you soon.